people in the Congress will push me to raise taxes and I'll say no. The president has concluded that tax increases are necessary. And they'll push again and I'll say to them. The charade is finally over. Read my lips. Translation, your taxes are about to go up. This is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Reporting tonight from NBC News headquarters in New York. Good evening. Read his lips. Campaign promises are made to be broken. However you want to describe it, President Bush today conceded that new taxes will be necessary to get the federal budget deficit under control. His statement was designed to start a bipartisan attack on the deficit. Instead, it started a partisan war of sorts. NBC's John Cochran tonight. This is what set off the political explosion today, a piece of paper on which President Bush finally said budget problems require tax revenue increases. Democrats who helped Bush write the statement over breakfast thought he had given them political cover to move ahead on taxes. The statement speaks for itself. The president has concluded that tax increases are necessary. I think someone who is complaining about uh, taxes being raised in the budget summit will have to complain against both parties. Uh, and the president if they wish to make that kind of complaint. But White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater tried to backtrack, saying the president wasn't necessarily proposing new taxes. For the first time, Fitzwater admitted that the no new taxes president has proposed hidden taxes for a long time. Fitzwater saying, in the president's previous budgets, there were some 13 billion in tax increases. True, but when the president first proposed those taxes, the White House called them revenue enhancers. Still, 90 Republican congressmen were upset, firing off a letter to the president. We were stunned by your announcement that you would be willing to accept tax revenue increases. A tax increase is unacceptable. If the president were to back down on his pledge not to raise taxes, I think it would have a dramatic impact on Republican candidates this fall. That, of course, is Bush's big problem, campaign promises. There are those who say we must balance the budget on the backs of the workers and raise taxes again. But they are wrong. I am not going to raise your taxes Period. Read my lips. No new taxes. But you know my position, and uh, I, I have no intention of, uh, of changing that position. But this spring, Bush began softening on taxes as the economy and tax revenues dipped. Today, he had to go further to keep the Democrats from walking out of budget talks, which Bush's advisors felt could have panicked financial markets. I want jobs. I want to see the deficit down. And uh, this bipartisan statement uh, speaks for itself. But Bush refused to say whether his Read My Lips pledge is dead. The Democrats said it is. But the president's conservative advisor, John Sununu, was telling outraged Republicans, don't worry, nothing has changed. And what looked like a bold presidential move this morning looks a lot less bold tonight. John Cochran, NBC News, the White House. Today's announcement will come as no surprise to most Americans who were well ahead of the politicians in saying out loud that they think the taxes will go up. Even a month ago on our NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, the prospect of a tax hike seemed very likely to more than half of the registered voters that we talked to. Another 38% said it was somewhat likely. However, people don't think that the administration of President Bush will be blamed for new taxes as much as the Reagan administration and Democrats in Congress. More than two-thirds told us that they would think no differently about the president if he went along with the tax hike. This poll was conducted among 1,000 registered voters. And one of the men in the middle of all of this is the Senate Majority Leader, George Mitchell, Democrat of Maine. He's with us tonight from Washington. Senator, you and Speaker Foley have been saying all along that you wouldn't get into this tax debate until the president signed on. Well, did he or didn't he today? He did. The president made it clear in his statement in language that is unambiguous, that he has concluded that tax increases are necessary to deal with the deficit. What's this business then from Governor Sununu, who's the White House Chief of Staff, saying there's nothing new in all of this and Republicans have nothing to worry about? Well, Governor Sununu is not the president, is he? The president, no, but he the does. President, the president's statement is very clear in writing, approved by the president. I was right there when he approved it, issued by the White House as the statement of the president. I think that's what counts. 
You're so even-handed in all of this, Senator. Aren't you a little unhappy tonight with the way the White House has handled this today? Well, I think that some of the statements made by White House officials which attempt to confuse or obscure the issue are inconsistent with the understanding of all of the participants today, inconsistent with the plain language of the statement, and obviously make it more difficult to deal in good faith on these matters. But the reality is that President Bush has said that it is clear to him that there must be tax increases to deal with the deficit. And unless and until the president personally and directly repudiates that statement or rejects his own statement, why then I think we should proceed in good faith and not be distracted by so-called background statements by other officials. All right, let's, uh, let's assume that the president does not repudiate what he has said today right. in that statement. Where will these new taxes come from? Well, that decision has not been made. That will be the subject of negotiations that will go on tomorrow involving senators, House members, and the president's associates who were present when the president made the statement today. And did the president have anything to say to you in a personal aside today as he signed that statement? Anything about, so read my lips? No, there were, he didn't say anything about reading his lips. He didn't sign the statement. It was drafted in his presence read to all of us in his presence, then typed up and handed around the room. The president looked at the statement and personally approved it. And it's as clear as the English language could be, and I think that's what we should accept. The president's conclusion is there have to be tax increases. Thank you very much, uh, Senator George Mitchell. I know we'll be talking more about this, much more about this in the coming months. Another major political announcement today from the president. He said vast areas of the offshore ocean bottom will not be open to oil and gas development until after the year 2000. That, of course, would be until well after the big races for governor in California and Florida this year and his own re-election campaign in 92. Canceled is an offshore drilling lease in the Georges Bank fishing grounds off New England as well. Leases off the southwest coast of Florida and around the Florida Keys also will be canceled. And 99% of the west coast was also declared off-limits to all drilling. The exception, one small area near Santa Barbara, California, which could be leased in 1996 if studies show the environment can be protected. Another environmental issue, the northern spotted owl. Last week, the federal government declared it a threatened species. Well, today, the administration announced what it called a partial plan to protect the bird at a cost of no more than 1,000 logging jobs. It also said it will seek changes in the Endangered Species Act to make it less restrictive. Also coming up here tonight on NBC Nightly News, Nelson Mandela, a rousing reception from a joint meeting of Congress. And Mike Jensen tonight on Donald Trump. He gets a bailout loan, but he'll also get an allowance, no more than $450,000 a month just for himself. Nelson Mandela says there can be no peace in South Africa until apartheid is ended. And that struggle, he said, is inspired by the lessons of Washington, Jefferson, and Martin Luther King, Jr. That was a welcome message to a joint meeting of Congress which gave Mandela a rousing reception today. Mandela made it clear the United States does have a continuing role. We still have a struggle on our hands. Our common and noble efforts to abolish the system of white minority domination must continue. We are encouraged and strengthened by the fact of the agreement between ourselves, this Congress, as well as President Bush and his administration, that sanctions remain in place. Few members of Congress were critical of Mandela's refusal to uh, renounce violence in the struggle against the South African government, but as NBC's national correspondent Bob Kerr tells us tonight, for most in Washington, Mandela is a photo opportunity they don't want to miss. It was the same in downtown Washington today as it's been in other cities, thousands hoping to see Nelson Mandela. But for politicians like Senators Boren and Sanford, it's not just seeing Mandela, it's being seen with him. I have to get the, the dome of the, of the Capitol behind you. Higher. 
That picture can be worth a lot of votes, really. And that's why Georgia Congressman John Lewis believes all kinds of politicians scramble so to get such a picture. Where would you like Mr. Mandela? They want to be seen, they want to be close with the most visible person at the time, the star, because it's good for them. Jesse Jackson took the liberty of straightening Mandela's tie. It paid off handsomely with a front page picture in USA Today. New York's Mayor Dinkins also was positioned well. Veteran campaign aides say it's no surprise. If I were working in a campaign for a candidate right now, I would run through brick walls to try to get a photo opportunity with Mandela. He's the Michael Jackson of 1990. Everybody wants to touch his cloth. Touching his cloth on TV with congressional photographers shooting away is enough to make any congressman's day. And Mandela's crowds are a boon to local candidates. Norton's campaign aides worked the line outside this Washington church. And, uh, people stood outside for three hours, and we went right down the line and got volunteers signed up for the campaign, got petitions signed. And it was the best day of our campaign thus far. We got over 500 signatures in, in two hours. Mandela's visit means more to politicians than votes. By threatening a showdown over a civil rights bill during the visit, Senate Democrats got the Republicans to agree to move more quickly on the bill. All but a few congressmen are willing to look beyond Mandela's friendship with Castro, Gaddafi, and Arafat. And today, Mandela noted jokingly that his visit has prompted unusual unity in Congress. The welcome that we have received from all of you raises the hope that perhaps one day we will hear that uh, the Democrats and the Republicans have merged. <laughs> While that surely is expecting too much, Mandela's courage and struggle for equality did bring them together this week. Bob Kerr, NBC News, Washington. Tomorrow, Mandela goes on to Atlanta and Miami. The mayor of Miami, by the way, and four other Cuban-American mayors in Florida's Dade County have denounced Mandela for praising Cuba's Fidel Castro and refusing to condemn human rights violations in Cuba. In a moment, one Germany, the painful lessons of capitalism. Tonight, part two of our series, One Germany, with East and West Germany joining their economies in just five days. That merger is our focus tonight. Think of two corporations that merge, one strong, one weak. A new way of business that can be painful. NBC's Mike Betcher. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest show on earth these days is set to begin. A circus and the communist nation which supported it are about to perform in the capitalist arena. The crack of the whip prompts an obedient response. So it is in the East German state circus. So it was for the East German people under communism. Now the whip has been taken away. Capitalism and competitiveness are coming. But even the lion tamer is scared that this state-supported circus won't survive in the free market. Reunification is very nice, he says. But wherever there's lots of light, there's lots of shadow. Thousands and millions of people are going to be unemployed because of this change. Tony Monekeller used to gaze from his East Berlin apartment window and wonder how it would be to live in the other world over the wall. Now Tony and his family know. His father tries not to show it, but he is worried. The furniture store where he works is reducing its bloated staff. Everyone's just trying to save his skin, he says. The bosses just fire people relentlessly. Resisting the new ways is futile. Even old communist checkpoints are adorned with advertising. Millions of East Germans already have signed papers to convert their almost worthless East marks to Western currency. They are preparing to embrace the change. Already, used car prices are listed in West German marks at Christian Ort's new East Berlin dealership. His pitch, buy now, pay later when you get the West marks. East Germans are finding the values of free enterprise, though, easier to understand than the West's conflicting moral values. Saleswomen representing a West German sex aids company now can openly sell their firm's catalog on a busy East Berlin corner. But East German women, who simply had to line up to receive abortion on demand, are afraid West Germany's tough regulations on abortion will be imposed on them after reunification. 
During four decades of division, the two Germanys developed different values. Their art and culture are now distinct. Actress Johanna Schall, who was a leader of last year's anti-communist protest, wonders if the East will lose everything that made it different from the West. A country that has to, to concentrate all its strength on uh, survival, on economical survival, has to, to think rather um, sh short-sighted, maybe. There is no choice, however. A new ringmaster is demanding that East Germans learn a new act. The lion tamer says he might have to sell his animals if the circus doesn't make a profit. Even such a brave man weeps at the prospect of failure. Under the new German big top, only the strongest will survive. Mike Betcher, NBC News, Berlin. In tomorrow's report, the huge task of building a modern East Germany, but with German discipline, they're talking about years, not decades. Back in this country in Wall Street, early gains today were lost to profit-taking. The Dow Industrials were down slightly in light trading. Suddenly, people are talking about living wills because of Monday's Supreme Court ruling. It said that people do have a right to die to cut off life-sustaining treatment, but, the court said, there must be clear evidence that's what the patient wants. And that, as NBC's Robert Hager reports tonight, is where the living will comes in. In New York, the organization with the most information about living wills, the Society for the Right to Die, got thousands of inquiries today. Yes, we distribute living wills. Scores came to the office to pick up forms. Adolf and Stella Hendler filled theirs out immediately. As long as we have each other, we can take care of the other person. But if we only, if one of us remains, I certainly don't want the children to be burdened with us. And I don't want to have a court step into our life and tell us how we're going to die. That's our decision. A living will is a simple statement instructing others what to do if your condition should become hopeless. A lawyer is not required. What is required is a couple of witnesses to sign the form with you. For the 41 states which already have statutes recognizing living wills, specific forms are advised. Otherwise, there are general forms with a direction to withdraw treatment that merely prolongs dying. Most include an option to list specific treatment you don't want. Devices which take over breathing, devices which restart the heart beating, or devices which feed by tube. And most include an option to designate some person to see that your wishes are carried out. Besides the Society for the Right to Die in New York, forms are sometimes available from senior centers, hospitals, or state departments of the aging. You have the right to refuse treatment you do not want. The handlers and others see it as a kind of insurance policy if the worst should happen. Robert Hager, NBC News, Washington. Listen to this. Federal health officials reported today that this country is leading all the world's industrial nations in one category. That's homicide among young males. The U.S. homicide rate is 20 times higher than it is in West Germany, 20 times higher than Japan's. Three-fourths of U.S. homicides involve guns. In Arizona and the rest of the Southwest, the temperature just keeps going on up, and the only thing falling are temperature records. Phoenix today registered its all-time high for the state, 122 degrees in the shade. That broke the old record, 120 degrees, set yesterday. And the heat wave is expected to stick around for a while, at least for tomorrow and Thursday. It is being called the second biggest armored car robbery in this country's history, and it happened today near Rochester, New York. Police say the driver and the guard were overpowered by a gunman who ordered them to drive to a remote spot. The money was then transferred to another vehicle. Officials say that more than $10 million was stolen in that robbery. $10 million, of course, is a lot of money, but it's not enough to cover Donald Trump for a full two years. Turns out he manages to go through more than half a million dollars a month for personal expenses alone. So today, when a group of bankers came up with $20 million in loans to help him through his business difficulties, they put him on a personal allowance of sorts. NBC's chief financial correspondent, Mike Jensen, tonight. Donald Trump this morning, after he signed for his new loan, as part of the deal, he's been put on a personal allowance. He'll have to scrape by on $450,000 a month. Next year, he'll be cut back to 375000 
and the year after that to 300,000. By comparison, in one recent month, Donald spent $583,000 on personal expenses. He also spent, and these are not included in the new restrictions, $246,000 on his personal Boeing 727, $841,000 on his yacht, and $2.1 million for interest on personal loans. Again, those are monthly figures. To raise money, Donald is trying to sell the Trump shuttle, which is cutting back on flights starting next weekend. Donald already has sold his shipyard in the Netherlands. He bought it to speed up construction of his new 420-foot yacht. Work on it has stopped. Donald also is trying to sell his old yacht. The price tag is $115 million, but it's negotiable. And Donald could even lose the dome of his new gambling casino, the Taj Mahal. He hasn't finished paying for it, and there's talk that the contractor might repossess it. Then there are the people who are suing for fraud. They bought junk bonds in Donald's Trump castle and want their money back. And the final straw, Donald's wife Ivana is said to be trying to unload some of her jewelry, including the ring Donald gave her after she found out about his girlfriend, Marla Maples. As for today's events, Donald Trump says he made a great deal, a fantastic deal, that his empire is intact and he's running it. But the bankers have another story. One of them told me, in our view, he's in bankruptcy, but instead of the courts presiding over a restructuring, we're doing it. Mike Jensen, NBC News, New York. That's now the news for this Tuesday night. I'm Tom Brokaw. I'll see you tomorrow night. And by then, Donald Trump will have spent another $15,000, if he's careful.